One of the world's busiest airports cancelled all flights after thousands of protesters crowded into the main terminal. And China's Aviation Authority has issued a major air safety warning to Hong Kong-based Cathay Pacific Airlines after it was widely criticized for support of anti-government riots that may expose the passengers to safety threats. How would the airline's fast-seating approach in dealing with the Hong Kong riots taint its own image and take a toll on tourism? While more and more Hong Kongers are backing up the police to bring violent rioters to justice, what would be the legal consequences? And where is Hong Kong's way out? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined here by Liao Fan, a law professor from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and the Tangan, current affairs commentator, and via Skype from Hong Kong, Dr. Tim Summers, senior consulting fellow of Chatham House, and Lawrence Ma, a barrister and chairman of the Hong Kong Legal Exchange Foundation. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rai. Hi, gentlemen. Let's look at the latest very serious escalation of uh, tensions, uh, particularly with a focus at the airport in Hong Kong. What would be the consequences if such situation continues? Uh, if, I may say, the most serious situation, we can find the answer in uh, Article 31, uh, Article 18 of the Basic Law, which specified that in such extreme situations where those kind of disturbance threats the national security and public order, and the Hong Kong government cannot deal with, deal with this properly, then the National People's Congress may declare a state of emergency, and the central government under this situation may decide that those national laws that usually do not apply to Hong Kong will apply to Hong Kong. So, I mean, we are talking about potentially like I mean, national security law or even criminal law. I'm not sure, but that could be the consequence. And uh, millions of people in the Chinese mainland, Hong Kong, and the rest of the world uh, must be holding their breath, so watching out for what's going to happen in terms of the worst case scenario since uh, uh, we've seen such a, a political unrest in Hong Kong uh, lasting for nine weeks with no end in sight. Yeah, and the, the political uh, the rhetoric is uh, amplifying, and now they are. Uh, these demonstrators have moved from the peaceful side to uh, more violence, and now they're approaching to be terrorists. These are people who are holding their fellow people hostage, trying to make sure that they feel afraid, may interrupting their ability to get to work, uh, to get to hospitals, to travel. And this is not only just them. They are threatening the very lifeblood of Hong Kong, which depends on trade. Uh, the financial side, being able to get there, the tourism. Uh, Hong Kong is either number one or number two, depending on what you're, you're talking about, in terms of the number of people visiting it. And they're going to lose that, that crown this year. Let me cross over to uh, Dr. Tim Summers, a senior consulting fellow of Chatham House. Hello, Tim. Uh, we're Hello. talking about the worst case scenario. Uh, everybody is following uh, the very dangerous situation at the airport in Hong Kong. Uh, our guest speaker, Anna Tangan, here in the Beijing studio, spoke of the issue of a terrorism. That might be the label to be used uh, by, uh, most, in most likelihood, the Chinese authorities to characterize the nature of the current uh, uh, anger of the young protests in Hong Kong. I'd like to have your thoughts. Well, I think what we've certainly seen over the last uh, two months is um, a quite a high degree of political violence. Um, uh, we've seen, uh, as you know, uh, a number of protests, and actually the vast, vast majority of people in Hong Kong have protested peacefully and have been able to do that and to express their views. Uh, but we've got into a pattern over uh, week by week where towards the end of the day protests turn ugly um, and there's serious clashes between protesters uh, and uh, the police uh, and that spiral uh, seems to be a, a negative one. The situation doesn't seem to be improving. So I think this political violence now seems to be a bit of a feature of Hong Kong politics just at the moment. I wonder uh, if Tim uh, uh, has followed the basic law 
What does uh, some of the uh, what do some of the articles in the basic law say about the emergency cases? Uh, I mean, in terms of the most likely intervention from the Chinese mainland, since uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Liao Fan here in the Beijing studio said clearly, uh, obviously the SAR government is losing control. Well, the basic law. There's a couple of articles that are relevant in the basic law that do allow for. Uh, the authorities, if there's a state of emergency or if there's a breakdown in public order, uh, they, they are able to call on the help and support of uh, the mainland uh, authorities. That could be through uh, the PLA station in Hong Kong, perhaps through some, some other means. Um, so the basic law, I think, does give some provision for, um, for that sort of uh, action to be taken. Uh, I interestingly, actually, the, the joint declaration is rather more black and white. The joint declaration simply talks about uh, public order being the responsibility of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region uh, authorities. Um, so there's a legal question, but perhaps the bigger question is a political one uh, over uh, the political consequences of some uh, much uh, more uh, active physical intervention from the mainland. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Liao, in almost all the official rhetoric and the open statements, the Chinese authorities, uh, mainland authorities, have made it very clear that we consistently support uh, the SAR chief executive, uh, uh, Carrie Lam, and the law enforcement officers in Hong Kong. It seems a lot more in the mainland are skeptical as to whether they are capable of handling the very special situation in Hong Kong. Uh, where do you exactly stand at this particular moment about the future of Hong Kong? Um, generally speaking, I would say Hong Kong police um, is one of the world's best police, I would say, in terms of their capability, in terms of their professionalism. But in this case, I would say maybe, uh, that's my personal opinion, maybe they have sort of underestimated the seriousness of this activity because I, every signal points to that this points to a uh, possible I mean conclusion that this is not a simple uh, activity organized by innocent students. There could be some vicious uh, force behind that. And I mean such an organized, such an I mean uh, massive kind of violent activities, I mean maybe they have not have prepared enough for this. So, I mean, we you can... You mean the uh, uh, police officers have been caught and prepared? Uh, they were utterly surprised by the uh, skill of such uh, well, angry protesters. So no, I, I don't think that's really the issue. I, it, right now, the, remember, this is political theater. It began with a protest, that a, a misinformed protest, that somehow China was using uh, a very heavy-handed uh, extradition treaty in order to reach into Hong Kong, which was the opposite of the truth. It was very, very mild, especially in comparison to the 30 other uh, extradition treaties that Hong Kong has had for years. So since that time, you have a group of protesters who have uh, gone from peaceful means expressing themselves, which is allow allowed by Hong Kong law, to increasing cycles of violence. And, you know, they're finding caches of explosives, of gasoline, Motov cocktails, uh, in addition. And these are being supplied by somebody. They're being warehoused. They're being distributed. This uh, forms the basis of a very sophisticated, as my colleague said, a very sophisticated uh, situation, which you wouldn't expect from ordinary students, especially the tactics where they do this hit and run situation. They attack a soft target and then they, uh, when the police show up they disperse and then they go to and hit another target. But let me get back to this PR issue. It is clear that, who, who, that whoever is behind this wants to goad China into taking some sort of heavy-handed action. Because once that happens, the international press, the international community will only take pictures of students who have a bloody nose or who've been you know, arrested and being dragged off and say that this is in tantamount to another Tiananmen, that this is a brutal crackdown on a peaceful, free, loving people. They will not cover the policemen, who lo the policemen who are losing fingers, who are being brutalized, who are being hit by bricks, who are being set on fire. They won't talk about that at all. So the Hong Kong police are in a very difficult position. If they 
act heavy handedly, they will lose the PR world, uh, PR war. If they don't, they're not living up to the capability of protecting the public interest. Thank you very much. Let me go back to our guest speakers uh, who are standing by in Hong Kong. Tim, um, students are in holiday. Uh, this is their summer vacation. Now, other than this, uh, let's look at uh, what could be done to minimize the impact of the students' wide and broad participation. Uh, some in the Chinese mainland say, hey, why don't we do something to suspend their, uh, their coordination and organizational work on the social media? Um, what would happen? Should the local authorities uh, uh, of the ICR government uh, do this to, uh, you know, to cut off their uh, networking? Because obviously the social media must have been mobilized effectively to put the students into the main terminal of, uh, of the airport. Yeah, well, I think I mean social media has been a big part of this um, uh, whole episode for for several months. It's been a big part of Hong Kong politics for many years, actually, back in. 2014 when we had the Occupy movement, social media was also uh, a big tool. I mean, firstly, it's a way, obviously, that people communicate with each other. It's a way that people organize their, their, their activities. But it's also been a way that people follow uh, and understand or maybe sometimes misunderstand what is, uh, what is going on on the streets. Um, but I think it's difficult to see how that could be, um, uh, how that could be stopped. I mean, you know, Hong Kong um, has uh, a free and open internet. That's an important part part of, uh, of the Hong Kong model, of the one country, two systems principle. Um, it, there's Wi-Fi, there's data services. I think it's difficult to see how, um, uh, how, that, could be, uh, how, how that could be changed. Uh, and, and would it solve the fundamental problem? Uh, probably not uh, either. Uh, Tim, uh, let, let's go back to the uh, issue of uh, Cathay Pacific, uh, the major carrier of Hong Kong. On Saturday, it fired two of its airport employees for leaking information and um, removed a pallet charged with rioting from flying duties. Now, Tim, uh, does the management level of Cathay Pacific have a profound understanding of these incidents? Um, I don't know. I think you'll have to ask uh, the, the Cathay Pacific management about that and about those uh, two cases. Um, obviously, they've attracted a lot of attention and, and, and comment uh, here in Hong Kong. I, th I think the more general point um, that comes out of those cases is that you know, Hong Kong society is, is quite divided and quite polarized over what's going on at the moment. You know, any large employer in, in, the, in the Hong Kong SAR uh, is going to have employees who have a you know, wide range of views. Some of them will be very supportive. Uh, some of them will be uh, strongly opposed to what's uh, going on uh, on the streets. Uh, I think it's a big, big challenge for any employer in these very politicized circumstances um, to work out the most effective way to respond uh, to what's going on. Oh, Goldman Sachs simply told any staff who were a part of it would be fired. So I don't know that it's that difficult. Uh, I can see people trying to walk the uh, between line, not to offend anybody, but quite frankly, they're siding, by doing so, they're in essence tacitly siding with these protesters. A few days ago, uh, Dr. Liao, uh, massive strikes were staged in Hong Kong that involved many uh, uh, employees from different walks of life. Uh, uh, let's look at the example of uh, Cathay Pacific. Uh, the pilot was fired and those two employees uh, also were dismissed. Uh, what would happen should uh, such divided public opinions continue to pervade every aspect of the society in Hong Kong? Because as uh, Tim said uh, correctly, uh, you know, within one employer or company, uh, spectrum of public opinions uh, was definitely and will be quite divided. In that case, uh, um, uh, do, you, do you believe uh, generally the prospects of the Hong Kong economy are likely to be paralyzed? I'm not so sure of the consequences of, I mean, economically, but uh, talking about the divided public opinion, uh, my personal understanding is that media coverage, media report, plays a not so good role in this. Uh, you mean selective. the media reports have been very selective in uh, covering media, some of the Hong Kong, in Hong Hong Kong. Kong local media? They've been very selective. Because we all know that there was a video uh, on, on the, uh, in, in the mainland, like in WeChat or on some uh, social media, that an older gentlemen were besieged by a bunch of uh, uh, men, men in black 
those those young guys point fingers at those uh, that old gentleman and yelling at him. But I asked my friends in Hong Kong. I mean, local media seldom report this uh, this issue. Well, the uh, integrity of the impartiality that we were taught during our study in the UK in the early 1990s made it very beautiful that uh, West media and uh, <laughs> media who have been influenced by Western uh, media education certainly believe that impartiality is first and foremost the most important principle. But what do you think of uh, media coverage uh, uh, and the integrity that should, that's supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, not so biased? Well, I, I think it's ideologically driven. There's this, uh, th these are all reporters who are coming from places where they have a, a different political system and they're assuming that their political system is right, American exceptionalism in essence. But it also applies to, uh, to European uh, press corps and, uh, and others. They believe fundamentally that uh, democracy is the only uh, way that a society can be run. And so when they see something like this, just like with the, the color revolutions and Arab Spring, things like that, they say, oh, isn't this wonderful? They don't really think about the consequences and what comes in afterwards. The fact is that the situation in Hong Kong will not be solved simply by having more police or by a brutal crackdown. What is needed here are long-term solutions. You have a large group of disaffected young people who have no sense that they have any future because their wages are so low and the housing prices are so high. There needs to be a real solution that gives them hope. Whatever solutions that are badly needed at this moment, the law and order must be restored to ensure safety, stability and prosperity of this uh, wonderful financing hub in Northeast Asia. Let me go to Lawrence Ma, a barrister and chairman of Hong Kong Legal Exchange Foundation for his thoughts on the latest uh, at the airport, the main terminal, to be more precise, in Hong Kong. W we were discussing uh, what would be the worst case scenario in Hong Kong should such an escalation, uh, escalation of tensions continue without being uh, sort of uh, stopped or uh, minimized by uh, certain intervention from the Chinese mainland. Um, I'd like to have your thoughts, Mr. Ma. Well, yes, we, we the, well, internal security and law and order uh, being uh, is the responsibility of Hong Kong police, as we all understand, under the one country, two systems. Um, unless there is a, beyond, a situation where which is Hong Kong situation is beyond the management of the Hong Kong government, which the Hong Kong government then can then request the assistance of the central government. In, in, in which case, the, um, that would be the time for the involvement of the People's Liberation Army. But other than that, um, if the Hong Kong uh, uh, police force can manage the situation, which it did pretty well at the current moment, uh, by ar arresting over 600 offenders um, over these sort of riots. So, I mean, it, 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 many of the people who are hardcore rioters are now uh, have been arrested and detained. So, we, as you can see today, now actually happening now in the Hong Kong International Airport is many people who are, they are not violent protesters. They are just protesters um, and they are scrambling in the airport, scrambling up on, in the airport, which uh, of course it caused uh, many flights that cannot land in Hong, in Hong Kong. Many from Hong Kong cannot fly away from Hong Kong. And the, uh, the latest news that I've got is that uh, the airport will start from 6 a.m. Um, this this coming morning to deal with all the flights so as to make sure that people who travel to Hong Kong can land here and they can fly away uh, to their destination uh, uh, according, to, according to plan. Uh, Mr. Ma, we are a little bit confused as to the real realities on the ground in Hong Kong. Uh, some of my friends uh, said on the WeChat that, look, Yang Rui, uh, normal life is not so seriously affected uh, uh, despite you know, uh, disturbance of the protests. Uh, but today, our attention was well, definitely the, the brought to a certain height uh, with the uh, focus on the airport. W what is the true situation there? Do you think normal life has really been damaged and irretrievably so? Well, the, the West was, um, I think, um, last Monday where there had been large-scale non-cooperative movements where trains, MTRs were stopped, roads and, uh, and art major artilleries were blocked, tunnels were blocked. Um, people took more than what, two hours to get home on a normal half an hour trip. 
and Hong Kong people were so angry about those people, um, and they start to react against them, whether physically or verbally. Um, since then, the, the, the process seems to have died down in relation to non-cooperative movement. Um, they have then refocused back onto the riots on the street at night time. So when the riots occur at night time, uh, for example, yesterday in Kim Sa Jui, where there are a lot of um, uh, uh, shoppers and shops, uh, a great shopping district for everybody, shops have to close down. Um, they, they close down early, people go home early, and then they started the riot. Now, of course, there's a disruption of the business in that particular area, and in Chiang Wan, in Sam Sui Po, and all these districts where the riots occur. But for people like me in Wan Chai and in Central, uh, the interruption isn't that great uh, when the riots is at night, um, as compared with non-cooperative movements, um, which interrupt every step of life here. Thank you so much. Anna, <coughs> uh, we were not just only talking about uh, the assistance that the SCR government is likely to seek from the Chinese mainland. Certainly, uh, our law enforcement officers, armed policemen, stand ready, get prepared to step in upon the request of the SCR government. But let's look at other sources of inf uh, intervention, such as the United States. Um, and uh, the U.S. consulate officials, including Julia Ada, political unit chief of the U.S. consulate general in Hong Kong, met and spoke with Hong Kong's former chief secretary, Aung San Chan Fang Aung San, and barrister Li Chu Ming, before meeting Zhou Ha Wan on the same day, uh, an opposition student leader. Does it further prove U.S. involvement in Hong Kong riots? Well, the U.S. government says that they talk to all opposition uh, leaders and they're just keeping communication channels. But you have to put this in perspective of, uh, of the, Mr. Lee going to, who is founder of the Democratic uh, Movement, uh, Independent Movement for Hong Kong, who met with Pence, Pompeo, Bolton. He met with uh, Pelosi. These are all people, and he was directly asking for assistance in making Hong Kong, in essence, a regime change. So this can't be ignored. Uh, also, you have the issue of these uh, non supposed nonprofits who have contributed funds to all of the groups who are involved in this protest. So when you start looking at uh, the, the verbal uh, uh, assistance that's being given by the U.S. officials, by the money that's being given, by the sophistication of the tactics that are being involved. It is very hard to believe that there is not a foreign interfer interference there and that it's not the U.S. So although there's no hard evidence, a tape saying, yes, we're conspiring to uh, do this, we want you to cause as much trouble as you can uh, for China. Uh, it is very clear, especially in the context of what's happening with the trade war, with ha what's happening with the, uh, the battleships going through the Taiwan Straits, that the U.S. is engaged in a full pressure, 360 degree uh, effort to try to get China to knuckle under and become a secondary power. Yes, indeed, the issue of Hong Kong must have been prioritized on the uh, agenda of Tsai Ing-wen, leader of Taiwan. At the same time, the Chinese uh, authorities accused the U.S., uh, the Pentagon, the uh, Nassau State Department of fostering arrest around the world, particularly Hong Kong in the latest situation. Now, at the same time, <laughs> China also says angrily that the U.K. Uh, is interfering with Hong Kong. Uh, they, they, they gave a phone call to the Hong Kong SCR leader. Now, earlier, Boris Johnson, uh, the new prime minister in number 10 of Downing Street said he supported the protesters. Well, he's made remarks, he made the remarks before he was uh, appointed by the Conservatives uh, Prime Minister to replace uh, Theresa May. Uh, May uh, Theresa. Um, uh, he said he had supported the protesters and would happily speak up for them and back them every inch their way. <laughs> Has he changed his mind? What's the latest attitude from this guy? Uh, I'm not so sure of his, uh, his latest attitude, but I, I hope that's just his slogan before he became uh, the uh, Prime Minister of UK. Because, I, I mean, UK, some people in UK, I think they have some uh, um, out, outdated uh, sentiment towards Hong Kong. Um, be, I, I, some of them even talk about the Joint Declaration of 1984, uh, saying that that declaration imposed some kind of obligation upon upon the Chinese government to treat when, they deal, when they're dealing with uh, uh, Hong Kong issues. But as our foreign ministry uh, spokesman uh, mentioned earlier, actually that is a historical document. And after that, Hong Kong affairs are, were totally 
dealt with in, in accordance with our constitution, with the basic law. So, I mean, UK is just one of the foreign countries. No special links with Hong Kong. They are not. That might be a bit controversial. Let me go back to Mr. Ma. Are you still there, Mr. Yes. Ma? Yes, yes, I'm there. Um, well, uh, I was told that uh, uh, British businesses in Hong Kong accounted for 40% of the total in Hong Kong. Has uh, uh, the British government uh, could exert a huge influence on the uh, stability and the prosperity of Hong Kong, uh, and they have done that since 1997, when Hong Kong was handed back to the mainland. What do you think of the actual influence of the British government? Well, I, I think many people are British trained particularly the civil servants, and uh, the, the press, many of them are also educated in the UK, uh, lawyers are educated in the UK, and the entire government system and the common law system are from the UK. So they, over, 100, 100 and, over 100 years of UK ruling Hong Kong, uh, and just a bit over 20 years of handover, people in Hong Kong do have some sentiments towards that administration. And particularly the senior officials in the Hong Kong government before, and some of them even now. So I mean, uh, they they have uh, many of them, e including our chief executive, I would say, uh, has has a home in the UK, and also has um, uh, probably not a foreign passport, but but have a lot of link uh, with the U with, with 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 the British. So as a result, the the British influence in Hong Kong is very subtle but very substantial in, in influencing people's um, public opinion, people's way of thinking, and they can easily get people, Hong Kong people, to ally with their, their views and interests. Uh, Mr. Ma, the, before um, we conclude the, uh, the, the live discussion here about Hong Kong, let me ask you very quickly. Uh, is it likely that the SDR government will make concessions to the protesters, uh, uh, particularly in terms of the five uh, requests that the student leaders uh, are seeking uh, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, utterly, completely end uh, the extradition bill and asking for the resignation of the uh, special executive, uh, as well as, you know, investigation into the alleged uh, misconduct of the police, uh, so on and so forth. So what are the signs for the SR government to make any serious concessions? Uh, what would be the most likely response from the mainland as a result? Well, I don't think the mainland has any role in it, but I don't think the Hong Kong government is going to give in to any commission of inquiry. Because the, the, the legal issue is if you have a commission of inquiry, that commission of inquiry only targets the government, and only in this case would be the police. And if you target the police, there would be the, if the police would, 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 would be more, the morale police would be very low if you do that for the government. And also, the sec secondly, the evidence given at the commission of inquiry cannot be used in, in a trial in a court of law for future prosecution in civil or criminal proceedings. So as a result, for example, you, if you lead a group of rioters or suspects to testify in a commission of inquiries and give evidence, this group of rioters or suspects cannot be prosecuted in a court of law, in a court of law later. So that is also the, 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 the second most yeah, important impediment to us agreeing to a commission of inquiry. Thank you so much. We have discussed a wide range of issues concerning the uh, uh, tensions in Hong Kong and the prospects of Hong Kong continuing to be a financial hub in East Asia. The f stability and restoration of law and always the first and foremost the most important principle to ensure a bright future of Hong Kong. Having said this, whether what happens in Hong Kong should be described as a mob rule or majority tyranny, uh, very detrimental to the stability of the territory, very detrimental to uh, the future of uh, the relationship between the mainland and Hong Kong. We're going to watch out and we're going to continue our discussion about the uh, situation there in Hong Kong. Until then, goodbye.